Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL school and course entitled uh, Trans Century Fiction where we're looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So we have already started with this text and I believe we've had a couple of lectures in this text already. So we'll just dive into the text and uh, just continue from where we left off because if you remember the final point in which she ended last lecture, we talked about the, uh, the quality of Marlowe's narrative and it was described by the uh, you know, omniscient narrator, the narrator outside the frame. Uh, something which uh, the narrative contains a meaning not in the center but on its periphery, right? So there's a centerless quality about Mother's narrative which has been emphasized already. And now we'll just move on to this next section which is important for us for the purpose of this course and this should be on your screen where the comparison with the Buddha is uh, very, very directly made and we saw already the beginning, uh, the very introduction of Marlowe, the way he's introduced in the text, uh, there was this uh, image of an idol, a god, uh, a tired god, uh, an exhausted god if you will, uh, with which Marlowe was equated and then, you know, uh, described. But now the Buddha image comes in uh, quite clearly and quite directly, but of course the entire Epiphany, the entire enlightenment the Marlow uh, embodies over here is one of darkness, not of illumination. But the irony is uh, the only knowledge available, the only illumination available, the only epiphany or wisdom available is that of darkness. So the only true knowledge uh, in this particular cultural and political setting is that of darkness. Uh, it could be a darkness of horror, of guilt, uh, of exploitation, or the knowledge of exploitation that imperialism uh, represents, etc. So you know, this is what the novel is about. And as I mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, it's, uh, it's a bit erroneous to look at Heart of Darkness as a critique of imperialism. It's not really a critique of imperialism. It's not really criticizing. It's not really saying imperialism uh, should be done away with. Uh, because remember, Conrad was a conservative writer and he was very much in a conservative tradition of writing. But uh, instead of a, a straight and direct critique of imperialism, what Heart of Darkness uh, represents or offers us is an ambivalent attitude about imperialism. Uh, this ambivalence about imperialism is what is important for us to understand. And there are politically incorrect qualities about Hollow Darkness. You know, it is in present day standards, uh, it is quite racist. Uh, in terms of the narrative, there's no non-white voices that we get to hear in Hollow Darkness. But it is precisely because of the you know, politically incorrect quality that is so relevant today. It's not trying to be politically correct at all. It's a novel about confusion, about cognitive confusion, about political confusion, about cultural confusion. So the Buddha image that we're about to see over here is uh, embedded with irony. I mean, it's not an uh, image which is one of straightforward enlightenment or wisdom or clarity of thought or clarity of knowledge, etc. It's rather a knowledge, uh, an embodiment of uh, confusion because the only knowledge available, as I mentioned, is one of darkness and confusion. Okay. So now we see the image uh, quite clearly described to us. Uh, mind, he began again, and this should be on his screen. Mind, he began again, this is Marlowe, lifting one arm from the elbow, the palm of the hand outwards, so that with his legs folded before him, he had the pairs of the Buddha preaching in European clothes and without a lotus flower. So again, this very uh, curious juxtaposition of Buddha in European clothes and without a lotus flower is part of the uh, entanglement as part of the confusing and confused entanglement that Marlowe embodies. Mind, none of us would feel exactly like this. What saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency, but these chaps were not much account. Um, so these chaps are not much account really. They're not colonialists. Their administration was merely a squeeze and nothing more, I suspect. They were conquerors and for that uh, you want to only brood first, nothing to burst off when you have it since your strength is just an accident arising from the weakness of others. This particular phrase is very, very important and this is perhaps uh, the most uh, honest description of imperialism offered in this particular novel uh, as a form of strength which arises just as an accident from the weakness of others. So it's nothing really to boast about. Imperialism is not really a civilizing mission, far from it. Uh, it's an exploitative mission, it's a show of force, a show of superiority uh, to brute physical force which is actually an accident which emerges from the weakness of other people. 
Okay, it was just robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a grand scale, and men going at it blind, as is very proper for those who tackle a darkness. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. So again, this insight into imperialism is important, and insight is one of cynicism, discomfort, ambivalence, and uh, generally one of guilt. But again, it's not a direct critique of imperialism. That's something I want to emphasize over and over again. So it is uh, a little erroneous, a little problematic to look at how the darkness has a very straightforward um, you know, deconstruction of imperialism. It's not that at all. It's very much an insider's insight into imperialism and looking at imperialism as what it is uh, and not really uh, a civilized mission. And look at the simplicity in Marlowe's description over here, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking it away from those who have a different complexion, so non-white people. So basically, what imperialism is, you just go to a place where you don't live, you take it away, you take away the resources and the, um, you know, the riches and the wealth and territorialize the place, you know, where people with a different complexion live or slightly flatter noses, right? It's not really the uh, European or Caucasian race we are talking about. So the different, the non-Caucasian races uh, and how uh, do they basically cater to the greed of the Caucasian race, the greed of the white imperialists is what has been described over here. It's not a pretty thing when I look into it too much. It's not really a pretty thing. It's not a noble narrative. It's not a civilizing mission. It's nothing of that sort. What redeems it is the idea only. An idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. So, you know, what he's saying over here is interesting that you know, the only possible redeeming factor of imperialism is the idea of efficiency, the idea of supremacy, an idea which is not sentimental, but, you know, something which is an unselfish belief, uh, uh, an unwavering subscription to an idea. And the idea could be one of supremacy, the idea could be one of efficiency, the idea could be one of uh, celebration of supremacy and efficiency put together, but that's the idea which backs imperialism. And you know, that is something you can set up and bow down before and offer sacrifice to. So what is told over here is very important because what Marlowe is saying is, you know, as an individual, you find imperialism as loathsome, as something which is detest detestable, despicable, because you clearly see it as something of an exploitative machinery. You exploit other people who look different, who have different complexions, who have flattened noses. Uh, but you know what is it, the only possible redemption about imperialism, according to Marlowe in this particular section, is a grand idea uh, of efficiency, a grand idea uh, of uh, you know efficiency along with supremacy. Right? And that grand idea, the grand narrative about efficiency and supremacy is something that you bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. So you sacrifice uh, your own agency uh, you know, you know, in, in the face of that idea and, uh, you know, because you have to bow down and subscribe to the idea. So the idea of supremacy, the idea, the grand narrative about European Caucasian supremacy is something, according to Marlowe over here, that's something which is worthwhile, the only worthwhile justification, the only backbone of imperialism that can possibly redeem it at any level. Okay, so, you know, so we can already see the discomfort and the confusion and the very, very ambivalent attitude about imperialism embodied by Marlowe because he's, he's refusing to look at it as a sentimental thing, he's refusing to look at it as a civilizing mission, as something which is noble, as something which is, uh, you know, one of uh, redemption uh, for the people who have been exploited. And there's something to be said about the kind of imperialism is actually representing because, you know, his was, I mean, the story over here is sort of Belgian imperialism in Congo, uh, which actually didn't have any pretense of any Christian, Christianizing mission or civilizing mission, unlike British imperialism in India, for instance, which had a, you know, very lofty narrative about civilizing mission. You know, if we see uh, the writings of Rudyard Kipling, uh, which talks about how imperialism in India was meant, was designed to civilize the natives, who presumably, according to Kipling, had no civilization whatsoever. So it was a British um, civilizing mission that you know, made imperialism a good thing. But Marlowe's imperialism, that brand of imperialism over here, I mean, although it's European imperialism, but it is Belgian imperialism in Congo, which never had any pretense, uh, any sentimental pretense, as Marlowe put it over here, uh, of civilizing or redemptive or whatever in that category. So the very clear-cut idea of imperialism is one of efficiency and supremacy. And Marlowe says that the only way it can redeem imperialism was by believing in this narratives of supremacy and uh, efficiency. Okay, so um, 
and then of course we have this very panoramic view of London and you know it's interesting how the visual narrative in Heart of Darkness is very cinematic in quality and there have been lots of um, films uh, loosely based on Heart of Darkness and the, the most famous example would be Apocalypse Now by uh, Coppola uh, which is uh, the setting is different but you know, if you're interested to watch it I would do recommend it quite heavily. The setting is in Vietnam, Cambodia uh, and the setting is an American Vietnam War uh, and the entire imperialism in that film is about is one of American imperialism. But you know, apart from that setting, the difference in setting, the rest of the story is very similar. There is a Colonel Kurtz in the film as well, played by Marlon Brando. Uh, and you know, the whole story is about recovering and retrieving Colonel Kurtz and the process and you know, getting rid of him. So, uh, and that, so this particular story, How to Darkness, it does, it has historically lent itself to cinematic narratives, to filmic adaptations. Uh, and you can if you see the visual narratives, the way the visual you know, scenes, uh, the visual grammar is depicted, it's quite panoramic in quality. So you have this very close up of Marlowe's face, where you can see his wrinkles, his shrunken face, his you know, tired uh, veins on his body. And then you take a long shot of London, which is very panoramic in quality, where you know it describes is described as a slowly breathing city, a slowly moving city, something slithery and serpentine about London and Thames, which can only be described using a long shot visual narrative. So this is what um, is described away. This is how it's described away. Yeah. Uh, flames glided in the river, small green flames, red flames, white flames, pursuing, overtaking, joining, crossing each other, then separating slowly or hastily. The traffic of the great city went on in the deepening night upon a sleepless river. We looked on, waiting patiently. There's nothing else to do till the end of the flood, but it's only after a long silence when he said in a hesitating voice, I suppose you fellows remember I did once turn freshwater sailor for a bit that we knew that we were fated before the ebb began to run to hear about one of Marlowe's inconclusive experiences. And look at the way in which the ebb of the river and Marlowe's story as a river, you know, they are so conjoined with each other. Uh, the fluidity of the river and the fluidity of Marlowe's stories are, you know, they are very dialogue with each other. So in that sense, the setting in River Thames, the fact that the story is told in a floating boat on River Thames, uh, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense, symbolically speaking, existentially speaking, and also functionally speaking, because we are told the Marlowe stories are one of inconclusive experiences. So, there's no conclusion, there's no, uh, you know, termination. So, the whole inconclusive quality of Marlowe stories is very much part of the fluidity, the part of the liminality of his experiences. There's no conclusion to be drawn. Uh, and that inconclusive quality is part of the cognitive confusion in How to Darkness, right? So, uh, the phrases in Heart of Darkness are very, very uh, important for us to pick and, and, and take a good look at. Right, so again, just to reiterate, the ebb beginning to turn uh, and, you know, waiting for the ebb to turn and, you know, listen to Marlowe's inconclusive experience uh, in the form of a very hodgepodge, entangled narrative. Uh, they're very dialogue with each other in that, in that category. Okay, so this is a point in the story. Uh, you know, where the story really starts. So, we, we get to hear Marlowe's story, uh, the real story of Heart of Darkness. And before that, prior to that, whatever we read so far, is part of the unnamed narrator telling us what happens. So, we have different frames uh, of narrative in Heart of Darkness. We have the unnamed narrator who is telling us a story about how he is in a river Thames on a, on a boat uh, along with Marlowe and so, some of the people. And then inside the narrative, we have Marlowe's story beginning to brew, and now we're about to get Marlowe's story. And then inside Marlowe's story, there are other stories as well, uh, particularly and most famously, the story of Kutz, uh, the, the renegade soldier of imperialism. Okay, so, um, you know, this is what Marlowe begins. Marlowe starts the story with this particular section, and this should be on your screen again. And this is Marlowe telling the rest of the uh, group in that particular boat. I had then, as you remember, just returned to London, after a lot of Indian Ocean, Pacific, China seas, a regular dose of the East, six years or so, and I was loafing about, hindering you fellows in your work and invading your homes, just as though I had got a heavenly mission to civilize you. So this whole idea of uh, civilizing uh, the fellow white people is ironical in quality, the heavenly mission to civilize you. 
uh, you know, it's, it's an ironic, uh, there's an ironic tone in this particular description because that was a common rhetoric used for imperialism that the heavenly mission of civilized and non natives, the non white natives. Um, you know, that was used rampantly, especially in British imperialism, that, you know, the whole idea of imperialism is one of Christianizing, civilizing, etc. So, this heavenly mission to civilize you, fellow, non fellow white people, is ironic in quality at this point in the story. It was very fun for a time, but after a bit I did get tired of resting. Then I began to look for a ship I should think the hardest to walk on earth. But the ships would not even look at me, and I got tired of that game too. Now, when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps, and this particular section is important. Uh, so, we have how uh, cartography or map making becomes a political process, a political performance, and that is what described over here. When I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for us at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself and all the glories of exploration. At, at that time, there were many blank spaces on the earth, and when I saw one that looked particularly inviting on a map, but they all looked that, I'd put my finger on it and say, When I grow up, I will go there. So, you know, this little section was uh, is actually very, very loaded in quality. So, map making, uh, as you will know, was very much a cartographic construction, uh, was very much part of the imperial mission. Uh, because map making, uh, in order to make a map, you need to classify territories. And classification can only happen from a particular point of view, a particular political point of view. So, you know, the whole idea of territorializing uh, unfamiliar places, uh, militarily territorializing, politically territorializing, economically territorializing, is accompanied by classifying those places, giving names to those places. So, map making has always been a very political activity. And Marlowe talks about a time where there were blank spaces on the earth. The map of the earth had blank spaces, which meant that they were still not invaded territories or not territorialized spaces. So, those are places which were still open for imperialism, still open for exploration, open for territorialization. So, in a map making, it was very much a territorializing activity, as you all know. Uh, it was a very political territorializing activity. And Marlowe's allusion to blank spaces on the earth, so spaces which have not been visited yet, is important over here because what that means is he has this fantasy of territorializing. He has this fantasy, this very European white fantasy of territorializing and controlling those spaces, right? So, you know, that, that is very, very, uh, uh, you know, clearly uh, evident even in Marlowe's imagination from his early years. So, when he talks about his fantasy for map making, his fantasy for looking at maps, and his entire projected fantasy uh, to go to the places which are blank on earth. Uh, that is very much part of the white masculinist uh, supremacist narrative of white imperialism. Right? So, I would put my finger on it and say, when I grow up, I will go there. The North Pole was one of the, those places I remember. Well, I have not been there yet and shall not try now. That glamours off because it is not really a place for imperialism. The North Pole, there is no resources, there is no oil mine, there is no diamond mine, there is no wealth to be heard from the North Pole. So, it is not really. So, one, one thing is very, very clear that when Marlow says a glamour is off, the whole fantasy, the whole fascination to travel uh, to unnamed places, unclassified places, uncharted places is not really one of geographical travel, it is not really one of um, that of the pure traveller. It is very much part of the political fantasy to territorialize, uh, it is very much part of the political fantasy to control, uh, to classify the, that, that particular space. And so, it is very much part of the imperial grid uh, where you can go to a place, territorialize it and take away the wealth because the North Pole would not serve the purpose. There are no places, there are no natives over there, there is no wealth over there, uh, there is no resources over there, unlike uh, you know, South America, Australia or Asia where there are land mines, uh, there, are, there are gold mines, sorry, there are gold mines, there are diamond mines, there are oil fields and there are other kinds of resources to be uh, you know, looted or controlled. So, the glamour of the North Pole, uh, the North Pole never really had a glamour and imperial fantasy is because of this. It is not really an imperialist kind of space. Other places were scattered about the hemispheres, I have been in some of them and well, you will not talk about that. But there was one yet the biggest, the most blank so to speak that I had a hankering after and that of course is Africa. So, Africa over here becomes the, uh, the fantasy space for the wide imperial imagination. Uh, the biggest blank space, the most blank, so to say, uh, the place which hadn't been travelled to, the place which hadn't been uh, trodden or territorialized yet, uh, and that territorialization is uh, still awaiting, still pending. So Africa be becomes very much that kind of space. So he had a hankering for that kind of space, fascination and fantasy, uh, to control that space. 
true by this time it was not a blank space anymore it had got filled since my boyhood with rivers and lakes and names so again you know the whole idea of filling up the blank space with rivers and lakes and names means that you know the white imperialist travelers are going there and territorializing and taking over because you can only give names to places from a particular perspective. Uh, obviously, those places had names. Obviously, those places had cultures and names and designations and everything else. But it's just that it was all African local names, which are unknown to the white imperial European imagination. So map making was very much a Eurocentric imperial process. It was a process of classification, a process of containment, a process of territorialization. So when you give names to places, uh, basically, you, you authorize, uh, you legitimize territorialization, you consolidate and, and, and confirm uh, territorialization. And I'm reminded at this point uh, of Robinson Crusoe, uh, the novel by Donald Defoe, which is quite possibly one of the first, uh, you know, definitely one of the first uh, novels about white territorialization in a non white space. Now, those of you who read the novel, and I suspect most of you have, you would know. Uh, that when Crusoe rescues a native uh, from that place, from cannibals, he names him Friday or Man Friday, uh, which is to say that you know he gives them a name, he gives them a Christian name, uh, makes him a Christian, and in the process he brands him as his property. You know he, he sort of territorializes him. So uh, by naming him Friday, he's doing two things. First of all, he's erasing away his uh, pre-imperial identity because of course the man had a name. We never got to hear the name. And secondly, uh, he's giving him a classified category. He's giving him a classified construct. Uh, Friday, the name given to him. It was a white man's name. It was a white name. So in the process, uh, he is claiming and consolidating him as a property. So likewise, when uh, Mother says over here that uh, Africa is getting filled in, the big blank space of Africa is getting filled in with names and rivers and uh, di different kinds of lakes, uh, which is to say that you know, more and more African, uh, more and more European travelers are going there, uh, imperial travelers are going there and giving names to those places, uh, you know, taking over those places, uh, territorializing those places. So it has ceased to be uh, a blank space for delightful mystery, a white patch for a boy to dream gloriously over. So again, look at the very masculinist uh, fantasy over here, a boy uh, dreaming gloriously over, a white patch for a boy, a white patch for a white boy actually, uh, to dream, dream gloriously over. So that is a mystery space, an exotic space without a name. Uh, so that exoticism, uh, that exotic quality is very quickly going away, very quickly disappearing because more and more white imperial narratives are happening in Africa and with those imperial narratives we have classifications coming in. It had become a place of darkness but there was in it one river especially, a mighty big river that you could see on the map resembling an immense snake uncoiled with his head in the sea, his body at rest curving afar over a vast country and a tail lost in the depths of the land. So again, this fascination with Congo uh, which is hardly named in Heart of Darkness, uh, the river, but the way it is described, an immense snake uncoiled. So it's very serpentine in quality, it's very exotic in quality, and you know, it's describing very exotic markers, uh, reified, commodified exotic markers, and definitely it's feminized as well. So the entire space of Africa, the entire people of Africa, uh, they are feminized uh, by this white masculine imagination as exotic signifiers, as exotic, uh, you know. Uh, locales, so to say. So the, the whole idea of the immense snake uncoiled uh, becomes, uh, you know, first of all, it's dehumanized. Uh, secondly, it is reified into something of an exotic quality, an exotic uh, entity, so to say. Uh, so the River Congo is not named, uh, but described as a mighty big river, as an immense snake uncoiled with its head in the sea, its body at rest, curving afar over a vast country and its tail lost in the depths of the land. So it's like a tail biting snake, so there's no tail left at all. So again, this inconclusive quality of Malu's uh, storytelling is uh, evident in the very beginning when it's describing certain things. And as I looked at the map of it in a shop window, it fascinated me as a snake with a, with, with a bird, a silly little bird. So again, look at the way in which this gaze is happening. Uh, I looked at the map of it in a shop window. So it's very much a consumerist kind of a thing. So you know, Marlowe goes to a shop window and he sees the map of Africa over there. So it's very much something to be consumed by the white male imagination, uh, adventure-loving imagination. And it fascinates him as a snake with a bird, a silly little bird. So you know, interestingly, uh, the 
uh, entire hunting narrative is reversed over here, uh, which is very ironical in quality. So the uh, River Congo or the white space of Africa, that little patch, the white little patch which is still uh, unnamed, it appears to Malu as a snake and he thinks of himself as a bird and uh, about to be gobbled or devoured by the snake. Why, you know, Historically and politically, it was the other way around. As we know, it was the white travelers, the white imperialists would go to Africa and take control, you know, take it over, totalize it completely. So the bird snake imagery way is interesting. It's a very interesting and ironic reversal of the historic phenomenon of imperialism, where you know it was the white imperialists going over and hunting down the non-white spaces and non-white people and non-white locales. But over here, uh, the, the hunting narrative is reversed in terms of his markers. So the white man uh, compares himself as a bird and he looks at himself, he looks at the mighty black river, uh, quote unquote black river, non-white river, in a shop window which is completely consumerist in quality as a snake. Then I remember there was a big concern, a company for trade on that river. Uh, dash it all, I thought to myself, they can't trade without using some kind of craft on that lot of freshwater steamboats. Why shouldn't I try to get charge of one? I went on along Fleet Street but could not shake off the idea. The snake had charmed me. So again, he, he thinks that, you know, there's a company uh, which is trading on the river and they obviously need steamboats. So, you know, he thinks he can advertise for a position, he can apply for a position, sorry. Uh, as a captain of a steamboat, presumably. And then he goes on St Fleet Street in London, but could not shake off the idea the snake had charmed me. So, you know, it's almost biblical in quality how he has been sort of bitten by the snake uh, and now is tempted to buy the forbidden fruit of imperialism. So now he's about to take or taste the, the forbidden fruit of uh, imperialism in Africa because the snake has charmed him. Uh, it's just like a snake in the Garden of Eden. Uh, who is about to destroy Malu's innocence, so to say. So again, th this kind of metaphor is a very ironic in quality because we are given an image that is the, the naive white man is charmed or intoxicated by the uh, non-naive, uh, surreptitious and potentially problematic and, and, and pernicious African uh, marker, which is the river Congo over here. Uh, and as a result of which, the, the naive white man is becoming a victim to that kind of an imagination, becoming a victim to that kind of an idea of imperialism. Uh, and that whole reversal, as I mentioned, of the hunter-hunted narrative uh, is important to, to, for us to understand the way. Right? Because historically, uh, we all know it was the other way around all the time, consistently. It was a white man who was a hunter. Uh, who hunted and totalized non-white spaces, but you know, in this particular session, it's reversed in a very ironic way. You understand, it was a continental concern that trading society. But I have a lot of relations living on the uh, uh, continent because it's cheap and not so nasty as it looks. They say so. Continent, of course, here is Europe. So you know, it's the European company. So now you know, Europe means uh, you know Brussels. Interestingly, even then. Europe meant, meant Brussels uh, to do Joseph Conrad, you know, and it's very, very dialogue with the way Europe is perceived by English people today. Uh, you know, EU is always Brussels today. So I'm sorry to own that I began to worry them. This was already a fresh departure for me. I was not used to get things that way, you know. I always went on my own road and on my own legs where I had a mind to go. I wanted to believe it of myself, but then you see, I felt somehow I must get there by hook or by crook. So again, this whole compulsion to be there somehow get a job in that particular company just so he can be in Brussels uh, and in Congo just so he can be in this projected fantasy space uh, is something which pushes Marlow uh, to, to really um, you know, go after people, like them for the job, etc. You know, use all his contacts, use all his relatives' contacts in order to get a job. Okay. My dear fellow, uh, the men said, my dear fellow, and did nothing. Then, would you believe it, I tried the woman. I, Charlo, Charlie Marlowe, set a woman to work to get a job. Heavens, well, you see, the notion, of, the notion drove me. And this is the point that I want to uh, spend some time on and end with the lecture here today. The presence of woman figures in Heart of Darkness, the female figures in Heart of Darkness. So, look at the condescending way, the patronizing way Marlowe talks about the woman. That, you know, I went to the extent of using women to get a job. So, the, the presumption is women can't get you anything. So, women are powerless, but I use them as well in order to uh, get a job. So again, the location of the woman, the location of the female figure, uh, apropos of white male imperialism, is very problematic in Heart of Darkness. And I think I did touch upon uh, a little bit of that issue at the beginning of the introductory lecture. But what Malu says over here and what he continues to say about the woman is interesting and problematic at the same time. I mean, it is interesting because it's problematic. So, uh, 
He says, I even tried the woman, I, and then he mentions one of his aunts. I had an aunt, a, a dear enthusiastic soul. She wrote, I, I, it would be delightful. I'm ready to do anything, anything for you. It's a glorious idea. I know the wife of a very high personage in the administration and also a man who has lots of influence with, etc. She was determined to make no end of fuss to get me appointed skipper of a river steamboat if such was my fancy. So this aunt very conveniently uh, comes and gives Marlowe the right contacts to apply for the job and she happens to know people, she happens to know the wife of someone who is very highly placed in a company and an administration uh, and then someone with a lot of influence as well. So she puts them in touch with the right people and that gets his job done. So again, I'm going back to Robinson Crusoe. If you look at that Daniel Defoe narrative, I'm sure some, most of you read it, you find that there are hardly any woman figures in the narrative at all. I mean, Crusoe marries in the end of the novel and his wife just inhabits one sentence in the entire novel while we're told that Crusoe marries her and then she produces male children and then she dies very conveniently, all within one sentence. So the entire presence of woman in uh, Robinson Crusoe, which is essentially and symbolically one of the first uh, European imperial narratives in fiction, that to the presence of woman, the function of woman is strictly, uh, you know, as that of a breeder, is that of someone who's backing the men, someone who's extremely subservient and secondary to the entire male fantasy of totalization and imperialism. And we have this aunt over here who is not even named, uh, you know, we never know the name of the aunt, uh, but he, she, she gets the job done for Marlowe. She just occupies a little section of the novel where we're told that she puts them in touch with the right people. She knows another woman who is the wife of someone high in the administration and then a man who has some influence in the company and that's how he gets his appointment. So I got my appointment, of course, and I got it very quick. It appears the company had received news that one of their captains had been killed in a scuffle with the natives. This was my chance and it made me the more anxious to go. It was only, uh, only months and months afterwards when I made the attempt to recover what was left of the body that I heard the original quarrel arose from a misunderstanding about some hens. Yes, two black hens. Uh, Fred Levin, that was a fellow's name, a Dane, a Danish person, who was an earlier captain in whose place Manu would be going as the uh, captain of a particular steamboat, thought himself wrong somehow in the bargain. So he went ashore and started to hammer the chief of the village with a stick. So, you know, this is the impenal red to begin to make his presence felt. The Danish guy called Fritz Levin, who was in charge of the steamboat, uh, he thought that he had been conned, he had been robbed. Uh, of some, some bargain uh, over two black hens. So he went all the way ashore and started to hammer and whip the chief of the village with a stick. It didn't surprise me uh, in the least to hear it and at the same time to be told that Fritz Clevin was the gentlest, quietest creature that ever walked on two legs. Uh, so this is a very important uh, point because we are told that Fritz Clevin is a very European, a gentle European. But look at what happens in gentle Europe in, in, in Africa, in the Congo. Uh, so this atavistic avatar is unleashed and he becomes a cruel sadist uh, in that colonial setting and, and this is what Marlowe tells immediately after. No doubt he was, but he had been a couple of years already out there engaged in the noble cause. The noble cause of imperialism is very ironic over here, you know, and he probably felt the need that at least at last of asserting his self-respect in some way. So the whole white supremacist idea of asserting supremacy, asserting self-respect, asserting you know, in superiority compared to the natives was what drove Fritz Levin to whip the chief of the particular village. Therefore, he whacked the old nigger. Again, the word nigger appears in How to Darkness as a banned word now. But again, then again, this is exactly why the novel is important for us today because of its political incorrectness. He whacked the white nigger mercilessly with a big crowd of people uh, watched him thunderstruck. Till some man, I was told the chief's son, in desperation at hearing the old chap yell, made a tentative jab with a spear at the white man and of course it went quite easy between the shoulder blades. Then the whole population cleared into the forest, expecting all kinds of calamities to happen, while on the other hand, the steamer Fritz Levin commanded left also in a bad panic, in charge of the engineer, I believe. So, you know, it was just the white man, the, the, the chief of the village, his son could not bear it anymore, could not bear his father being beaten so mercilessly anymore. So he drove an arrow uh, in Fritz Levin's shoulders and that killed him instantly. And what is interesting to see how the entire village disappeared immediately after because they thought, because the white man has been killed, 
some natural calamity will happen to them. And again, look at the way in which the idea of supremacy is ingrained uh, in imperialism. And uh, you have to convince the non-white people that the white man is superior, that the white man is God. So killing the white man is almost uh, a, you know, um, a sin, not, not a crime. So there'd be a divine retribution, there'd be a divine calamity. So the whole entire village just disappeared, a fear in the calamity to happen. And the stima in which priest Levin commanded, that, that ran away as well, that, that, that escaped as well in bad panic. Because this was an accident, it was an interruption of what normally happens, the normative, normal narrative imperialism, where the white man beats the non-white man. So that narrative has been interrupted with the white man being killed over here. So uh, that, that steamer had left uh, in charge of the engineer. Afterwards, nobody seemed to trouble much about Free Sullivan's remains till I got out and stepped into his shoes. I couldn't let it rest though, but what an opportunity offered at last to meet my predecessor. The grass growing through his ribs was tall enough to hide his bones. So when Marlow finally meets the corpse of Free, Free Sullivan, uh, he finds the grass was, had grown long enough through his ribs to hide the bones. So it's a very symbolic image of the white man going and meeting his predecessor, the earlier imperialist who had been killed and whose, whose skeletal remains are present now. Okay, so, um, and then this whole idea of calamity, the whole idea of, um, you know, fear of having killed a white man and that, that is described in some details. And then we are told the mad terror had scattered them. The village was a mad terror because they were convinced that some calamity would befall them. Men, women and children through the bush and they had never returned. What became of the hens, I don't know either. So again, look at the, uh, there's almost a dark comic quality in Heart of Darkness as well, which keeps making its presence felt. Because the entire, uh, uh, the entire quaddle away, the entire uh, tough away, uh, tough away is about some hens. So Malu says, I don't know what happened to the hens because the entire uh, beating was because of the hens, the entire murder happened because of the hens. So I should think the cause of progress got them anyhow. However, through this glorious affair, I got my appointment. Therefore, I fairly began to hope for it. Before I fairly began to hope for it. So you know, it's because Free Slave and the Danish uh, captain of the particular steamboat got killed because of two hands, a uh, bargain about two hands is because of why you know, Malu gets his job. So you know, look at the way, I mean, the reason why the entire thing is trivialized, uh, and that tells us something as readers. Uh, when, you, when you actually come to the bottom of it, how did, you know, imperialism is actually about a bargain, it's actually about bargains gone bad, it's about uh, one-sided bargains, it's about the terror that comes out of bargains, but essentially it is about bargains, it's about a mercantile activity, a merciless mercantile activity. It's a mercenary mercantile activity which is uh, what it's all about. So everything around imperialism, the normal narrative about civilizing, superiority, supremacy, etc. If you take all that away, it all comes down to a bargain. So the two hens over here are important, they're quite symbolic presences uh, in this point in the story because what we're told is, you know, the entire quarrel, the entire uh, tussle, the, you know, the tiff that happened was because of two hands uh, and the free slave and the Danish person was very gentle otherwise, he somehow thought because he got a bad bargain, he had to make his superiority felt, he had to assert his superiority. So he got ashore, started whipping the black man, the, 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 the chieftain of the village and at some point when the son of the chieftain could not take it anymore, he drove a, you know, a, an arrow through Free Slevin's uh, ribs and that killed him immediately. And that was the uh, reason why uh, Malu got the job in the first place. So he had to fill, an, fill in a vacancy which had emerged, which had, which had happened because of an accident, which had happened because of a bargain. So it all came down to a bargain about two hands and the two hands over here become a symbolic presence over here because you know, that tells us that imperialism at the end of it all, at the bottom of it all, is about bargains. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with the story uh, as we move on to the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.